Good morning from uh, Grace Church in Shrewsbury, Pennsylvania. We welcome you this morning wherever you're watching us from, whether you're in York County, Pennsylvania, or Baltimore County, Maryland, or Spring, Texas, or Austin, Texas, wherever you are watching us from, we welcome you this morning. It's a little different to be in an empty building, but we know God is here. We came in uh, social distancing. We're, we're about six feet apart. We've got plenty of hand sanitizer here, and we have plenty of God. Amen? Amen. And uh, we're so pleased to be here. Stephanie, she's in health care, and uh, this is her first day off in 22 days, and she chose to come in this morning and worship the Lord. And uh, we have a small group with JB and the Greggs and Travis and David and Pastor but we have the most important person in this room today, and that's Jesus, our Lord. Amen. So wherever you are this morning, we ask you to join us. If you know the songs, sing with us, whether you're in your couch or your bed, wherever you are with your first, second, or third cup of coffee, we welcome you to join us this morning. If you don't know the songs, just worship with us. All of these songs this morning are going to be about the love of Jesus, and that's the only reason we're here is to say, Jesus, we love you. We know that you love us, dear God. And so this morning, for the next hour plus, we set aside anything that's going on in our world, and we just concentrate on you, the glory and the lifter of our head, Jesus Christ. Amen. How deep the Father's love for us. How vast beyond all measure That he should give his only son To make a wretch his treasure How great the pain of searing long the Father turns his face away As wounds which mar the chosen one Bring many sons to glory Behold the man Behold the man upon the cross my sin upon his shoulders ashamed i hear my mocking voice call out among the scoffers it was my sin that held him there until it was accomplished his dying breath has brought me life i know that it is finished i will not boast i will not boast in anything no gifts, no power, no wisdom, but I will boast in Jesus Christ, his death and resurrection. Why should I gain from his reign? I cannot give an answer, but this I know with all my heart. His wounds have paid my ransom. Why should I? Why should I gain from his reward? I cannot give an answer, but this I know with all my heart. 
His wounds have paid my ransom. Well, amen. Well, good morning, Grace Church family. It is good to have you with us. As Ron said earlier, Ron said a lot of things very perfectly this morning in that opening monologue before we had our prelude. So I'm not going to go over a lot of it because I can't say it any better than what he did. I do just want to remind you this morning as we worship, whether it's on our Facebook page or whether you're watching from our website and the link that was available there, there are some other things on our website that can be of use to you this morning. If you're new or visiting for the very first time and you'd like to connect with us, there is a connection card button on the, on the front page of the website. You can go there and fill that out and hit submit and it'll come to us. There's also a prayer request form that you can fill out. You know, we're going to continue to storm the throne of grace during this time. So whatever it is that you are struggling with, whatever it is that you need to be lifted up in prayer or encouraged about, you can fill out that form and it'll come to me and it'll come to our prayer team here at the church and we will keep it lifted up in prayer as well. There's also a congregational care form that if there is a need, if you have a specific need today, or you know of someone within our congregation or community that has a specific need, you can fill that form out and that'll get in touch with our congregational care team. Or if you would like to be a part in serving and connecting uh, within our ministries to help those during this time, you can fill out that as well. And then last but not least, as Travis will be talking to us a little bit later, there is the online giving button. We want to thank everybody for the fact that there has not been a lag in our giving during this time. We are truly blessed with faithful and generous people within our congregation and within our community. But we just also want to continue to remind you that there is that option that you can continue to give unto the Lord and the mission and the ministry here of Grace Church that makes all of this possible. Before we go any farther, I also just want to thank, thank, thank our tech team for continuing to come in here, be willing to get stuff set up, to be able to make all of this possible. I also want to thank those who are able to come and be leading us in worship. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for doing that. Uh, it is truly a gift. So please be kind, be gentle. The live feed may not always be where it needs to be. I know Facebook's getting flooded during this time with live feeds and messages. Like I said last week, every single pastor in the world now is a televangelist. So we're not the only ones doing this, especially in Southern York County. So please be patient with us. We'll try to address any situations that may come up, but just be thankful. Be thankful with what we have and the fact that we can connect this way on a Sunday morning when we can't be together physically. Let's go to the throne of grace one more time this morning. Heavenly Father, we do thank you and praise you for all that you have done and all that you are doing. Lord, we come into your presence now and we ask, Lord, that we would give our focus and our attention to you. Whatever it is that may be heavy on our heart, may we lay it at the foot of the cross. Whatever it is, Lord, that we feel empty and drained for, may we be filled with your Holy Spirit. Lord, wherever we may be in worshiping this morning, may you take away any distractions. May you take away anything that may be hindering our attention. And Lord, may you give us a soul focus on you this morning, Lord. We come before you because you are worthy to be praised. We come before you because you are able to work in the midst of whatever is going on in our world and in our lives. And Lord, that's what we do. We cry out to you this morning for our congregation. We cry out to you for our church. We cry out to you for our community. Lord, we cry out to you asking you, Lord, to give wisdom and guidance and direction to our leaders, both in government and within our healthcare systems. Lord, you hold all the answers. And we come to you asking, Lord, for you to move and work in a very powerful way for your gospel's sake. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, our risen Lord and Savior. And all of God's people said, He is 
jealous for me Love's like a hurricane I am a tree Bending beneath the weight of his wind and mercy When all of a sudden I am unaware of these afflictions eclipsed by glory And I realize just how beautiful you are And how great your affections are for me And oh, how he loves us so Oh, how he loves us how he loves us so thank you god if you know this church sing with us he is jealous for me Love's like a hurricane I am a tree Bending beneath The weight of his wind and mercy When all of a sudden I am unaware of these afflictions Eclipsed by glory And I realize just how beautiful you are and how great your affections are for me and oh how he loves us so oh how he loves us how he loves us so and oh how he loves us so oh how he loves us how he loves us so yes he loves us oh. by the grace in his eyes and if grace is an ocean we're all sinking then heaven meets earth like an unforeseen kiss and my heart turns violently inside of my chest I don't have time to maintain these regrets when I think about the way that he loves us oh how he loves us oh how he loves us oh how he loves yes he loves us oh how he loves us oh 
Avenue Church, we're in a time where we're doing the social distancing. And I heard pastor say this morning that there is no social distancing with God. Isn't it good to know that he's there for us any time? We can d touch him. We can just touch out and reach the hem of his garment. He said, come to me, all who are weak and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And during this time where, <laughs> unfortunately, on Friday, when I saw my kids and grandkids, I had to keep six feet away from them. Ooh, the pain that came through Vaughn and I at that time. But can you imagine there are people right now who are not reaching out to God? Of all the times to need Jesus, we need him now more than ever. We need not to walk to him. We need to run to him. We need to reach out to him and say, Lord Jesus, we can do nothing without you. We tried it on our own. The world has nothing for me, God, but only you. And Jesus says, I will wrap myself around you. I will wrap my arms around you. And I will take care of you if you will just reach out to me during this time. Wrap me in your arms, 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 wrap me in your arms. There is a God who loves me. Who wraps me in his arms. And that is the place where I'm changed and that's where I belong take me to that place Lord to that secret place where I can be with you. You can make me like you. Wrap me in your arms. 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 There is a God. There is a God who loves me. Who wraps me in his arms. And that is a place where I'm changed. And that's where I belong. Take me to that place, Lord. To that secret place where I can be with you. You can make me like you. Wrap me in your arms. 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 Wrap me in your arms.
Wrap me in your arms. Wrap me in your arms. Wrap me in your arms. Church, wherever you are, wrap me in your arms. Wrap me in your arms. Wrap me in your arms. We've all kind of had our lives flipped upside down the last few weeks. And it's scary. There's fear. There's, there's anxiety. We're, we don't know when we're going to come out of this. Uh, yesterday, as I was sitting in my office, um, and it's pouring outside, and all of a sudden I hear the chirps of a little bird who's found some shelter right outside my window. And it just hit me in that moment that what we need to do is that we need to find shelter in him. And we just need to praise him during this time. Praise him through the rain. We're going to come out of this. And we just need to worship him. Let his presence 
to his worship. Worship the Lord. Oh, Stephanie, sing that verse again. There's no way out. When there's no way out. Come on. No, no. Except through a miracle. Come on, that's what we need right now, church. When there's no way up a mountain except to climb it. Mm. When everything that you hope for seems gone. And every dream you dreamed of is so far away just lift your voice and say all I need to do is worship I'm gonna worship all I need to do is say his name out loud all I need to do is lift my hand surrender Father God, we want to pray for our pastor now. We want to reach out across the miles and ask that you bless him and strengthen him this morning. Empower him with the Holy Spirit that he may bring your word to us. That we may receive it in spirit and truth. We thank you for him, Father. We thank you for your servant that you have provided. Be with him and his family in this time of health crisis and keep them strong and safe. And give us ears to hear and eyes to see what you have for us this morning. All these things we pray in your son's name. Amen. Amen. I'm asking our lone usher to come forward for today's offering. Good morning, Grace Church. As Jeff mentioned earlier, we want to thank you for continuing to send in your offering and to continually supporting Grace Church as we continue to support this community, not only 
here in these walls, but continue on outside further. I am just overwhelmed by the amount of people sending in their donations, not only here physically, but also online. And we'd like to take this time to remind you that you can do it online by going to our Facebook page and there is a give online option. If you have any questions or would like to talk through the process, please give me a call. My name is in the directory and I'll be more than happy to walk you through how to get this set up securely and on a regular basis if you'd like. And with that, would you please bow your heads for an opening prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you for everything that you continue to do for us and thank you for having us know that you are in control of this situation. We have faith in you, we have faith in your son, and more importantly, we know that you are in control of this. Be with those that are dealing with this virus as you give them healing over it, and be with those that are being tested for having results of negative returns. In your name we pray, amen. Thank you, choir boy Travis. Well, Grace Church, before we get into the word this morning, just a couple more announcements. I uh, just want to remind you that uh, we are doing daily psalm readings on our Facebook and Instagram page. We have extended an invitation to people within the congregation. If you would like to do a daily psalm reading, uh, send me an email, send me a message. Uh, let me know which psalm you'd like to read or portion of a psalm that you'd like to read. Um, videotape it, send it over, want to make sure that there's no duplicates, uh, psalms that we've already done. But if you'd like to be a part of that, your family wants to be a part of it, we would welcome it. We're trying to extend this out as long as we need to, uh, and it's just a great source of uh, comfort and reminder of the Word of God, especially through the psalms. Uh, also, uh, our, we're going to be continuing our virtual worship and virtual ministry here at Grace uh, until things change. Um, so this is kind of an indefinite sort of thing right now. So we'll be virtually again Palm Sunday. Uh, more than likely, we will be virtual on Easter Sunday. Uh, I'm going to be meeting with the um, council later on this week. Uh, hopefully we can come up with a plan as to what we're going to do for Holy Week and for Easter and get that out to you as soon as possible. Um, but the great thing is, church, is that, you know, Easter Sunday each year is celebrated on a different date. So even if it's not your typical Easter Sunday or if we plan to do something different, remember, Easter should be celebrated every single Sunday. We're not missing anything just by missing the date that's on our calendar. We gather together even here and now as Christians because Christ is risen. And he is risen indeed. That's our identity as Christians. So we have that. And... Um, Another announcement that I want you to make, uh, one of our most beloved, uh, uh, most wise members within our congregation, Miss Mildred Schaefer. On Thursday, Miss Mildred Schaefer turns 100 years old. And so her address is in your directory. I want to encourage everyone at Grace Church, if you can, send her a birthday card this week. I know she would be absolutely overjoyed. Miss Mildred is, you know, a shut-in. She's not able to get out and join us physically here, even when we do gather physically. But I think it would be a wonderful testament to the love that we have for her here at Grace Church, sending her one on that milestone birthday on Thursday, 100 years old. So happy birthday to her. And then last but not least, I want you to know that uh, because you are in the comfort of your own home this morning worshiping, uh, I don't want to know what it is you're wearing, but I imagine it's not what your normal, your normal church clothing would be. I, too, am in comfort this morning. I am wearing my slippers to preach to you this morning. I figured if you can be comfortable, I can be comfortable. And who knows, maybe next week I'll wear shorts behind the pulpit. You'll never know. Or maybe I might even be in my pajamas. We'll see. We'll see how this goes. But hey, if you could be comfortable, I can be comfortable. I even talked to the, some of the team this morning. I said, maybe, maybe, you know, that whole Christmas Eve service thing that we did where we had the couches and the fireplace up here, maybe we need to go back to that on Sunday morning and have some fireside chats for worship on Sunday. Who knows? Uh, but stay tuned. Things may change around here. That seems to be the common theme. Amen? 
Amen. So, take your Bibles this morning and turn to Mark chapter 14. Mark chapter 14. This is uh, one of these texts that we're going to be looking at today. Mark 14 verses 51 and 52. That is one of those texts that will pique your interest. It's it's one of those that for me is a head-scratcher sort of text. It's... um, It makes you wanting more information than what the Bible gives. This was a text uh, that was brought to me by a person within our congregation. I was was challenged to preach it. I had it marked on my calendar for a long time uh, to preach it on March 29th because it was a fifth Sunday. I try to do some different things on fifth Sundays. And uh, just as uh, Mike Summers had given me a challenge before of something to preach, this person had given me a challenge of something to preach, and so I took up that challenge, and that's what's coming to you today. Not knowing the situation we would be in. And what's interesting is when we look at this text today, you're going to see just how much this text is relevant to what you and I are going through here today. What the world that we're living in, the situation that we find ourselves in, it's very applicable You know, for me, there's more than one of these texts, not just Matthew 14, verses 51 and 52, but to me, there's two other head-scratcher texts that I look at in Scripture, and I want more information, try to do a little bit more digging. One of them is Genesis chapter 6, and and I won't go into too much detail, but it's what caused about, or what God, or what caused God to bring about the flood, and that was uh, the sons of God, as it says, coming down and um, mating with the women on the earth and and creating what is apparently the super race that came about. Uh, Take the time this week, read Genesis 6. It's very interesting stuff, and there's a lot of theories to that uh, as well. We won't go into that, but also Matthew 27, where it says that after Jesus gave up his spirit on the cross, that all of the dead came out of their graves and walked the earth. And that's all that's given is that one verse. And it says that they continued to appear to people until... Christ uh, after his resurrection and his ascension. So I, I just read that verse. I'm like, I want more. This is like the zombie apocalypse going on here in the Bible, and they just give me a verse. But we got to trust sometimes that the Lord gives us exactly what we need, <laughs> even if it's not the detail that we want, right? This is the complete word of God. And it's all there. So Matthew 14, verses 51 to 52 is the text. But in order to get a good understanding and to, un- and to gain the context as to what's going on, we got to look at some of the passage before leading up to 51 and 52. And what we find is in Matthew 14, starting at verse 32, is that Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane. It's the night in which he is betrayed. And he takes his disciples with him, and they go, and he asks them to pray. And three different times as Jesus goes a little farther, and it says that he's praying and he's crying out to God, knowing what he's about to go through with the crucifixion, knowing the suffering and the, and the whippings and the beatings that he's going to have to uh, do for, to bring about our salvation. It says that as he was crying out to God, he was sweating blood. That's how much he was crying out in prayer and how much this was weighing heavy on him. That even when he asked his disciples on three different occasions to pray with him, he would come back to them and he would find them sleeping. Wow. I I can't imagine the disappointment, maybe, that was in Christ. Can you at least pray with me? Knowing what he was about to go through, and he finds them sleeping on three different occasions. But on the third occasion in which he finds them sleeping, if you look beginning at verse 41 of Matthew chapter 14, he says, And he cometh the third time and saith unto them, Sleep on now. In other words, just just continue to sleep. Take your rest. It is enough. The hour is come. Behold, the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. He says, Rise up, let us go. Lo, he that betrayeth me is at hand. Speaking of Judas. Now follow along with me in verse 43 leading up to our text to say, it says, And immediately, while he yet spake, cometh Judas, one of the twelve, and with him a great multitude with swords and staves, from the chief priests and the scribes and the elders. And he that betrayeth him had given them a token, saying, Whomsoever I shall kiss that same as he, take him and lead him away safely. And as soon as he was come, he goeth straightway to him and saith, Master, Master, and kissed him. That being Judas. Kissed him on the cheek. You know, I I read a commentary this week, and I never really noticed this. 
you know, in the Gospels, you see uh, the 11 disciples call Jesus not just Master, but they also call him Lord. But there is never an instance in which the Gospels in which Judas calls Jesus Lord. He only ever calls him Master. And of course, we know Lord is greater than Master. It's just an interesting thing, especially when he comes to betray Jesus. He says, Master, Master, and, it, and he kissed him. In verse 46, it says, And they laid their hands on him and took him. And one of them that stood drew a sword and smote a servant of the high priest and cut off his ear. We know that being Peter. Peter cut off the servant uh, of, of, of the high priest, Malchus, um, and, and, and the ear fell. And what we know that's not revealed here is that Jesus then stood and, and grabbed the ear and, and actually healed Malchus and put it back on his ear. It says, And Jesus answered and said unto them, Are ye come out as against a thief with swords and with staves to take me? I was daily with you in the temple teaching, and ye must, and ye took me not. But the scriptures must be fulfilled. And they all forsook him and fled, being the disciples. And then we get to our text this morning, verse 51. It says, And there followed him a certain young man, having a linen cloth cast about his naked body, and the young men laid hold on him, and he left the linen cloth and fled from them naked. Yes, there was a streaker in the Garden of Gethsemane. Before we go any farther, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do again thank you for the day that you have made and the ability that we have to gather. And Lord, we now ask that your word would be illuminated. Father, that you would have your Holy Spirit bring a fresh revelation to this text. And Lord, that you would take it and you would apply it to our lives in a way, Lord, that we would find comfort. Lord, that we would be encouraged. And Lord, that we would even be convicted. Convicted to change. Convicted to be more like you and to show your gospel light during this time. Speak to us now through your word, Lord, in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. And all of God's people said, amen, amen. So there's two main questions that I think surround this text that we have here in Mark 14, verses 51 and 52. The first question is, who is the certain young man that is spoken of in the text? Who is the certain young man that is in the garden? And unfortunately, I come to you this morning and say that after searching all of the different commentaries that I have, after researching it, nobody knows. There is not a definitive answer as to who the certain young man is. Now, there's a lot of speculation, but nothing is concrete. And let me give you some of those uh, in terms of the speculation this morning. Some believe it is John. It is John that wrote the gospel. It's John that's later exiled on the island of Patmos. It is John who, uh, you know, he says in his gospel most times that, you know, he was the one that Jesus loved the most. And, and the reason that some believe it's John is because that John was believed to be the youngest of the disciples. And it says in the text that it was a certain young man. Some believe that it's Lazarus. Some believe that the certain young man is Lazarus, and they, and they believe that because, again, it, separ it separates the certain young man from the disciples who are talked about earlier. And they say that it's Lazarus because they point to John chapter 12, verses 10 through 11. And in that verse, it says that after Jesus rose Lazarus from the dead, that the chief priests wanted to kill Lazarus. And the reason they wanted to kill him is because Many came to believe on Jesus as a result of Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead. So here is this very powerful figure as to the, the, the Messiahship of Christ. And they wanted him gone. They wanted to get rid of it because it had caused so many people to leave their power and authority and follow Jesus. So some believe it's Lazarus, that they would want to grab him in that garden that night. Here's our chance we can take Jesus and we can also take Lazarus, who would be there with them. 
Now, uh, this is a really far out one, and, and it stretches a lot, but it, it's kind of really interesting when you put the dots together. I don't necessarily subscribe to this one, but I thought I'd bring it to you. Some believe that this certain young man is an unidentified young man who had died and was buried in the Garden of Gethsemane. And that when the guards and, and, the, and the chief priests and the Pharisees and the scribes came to arrest Jesus that, uh, that night, in John chapter 18, Jesus says in verses 4 through 6, he says to them, Whom do you seek? And Jesus, and, and they said, you know, we seek Jesus of Nazareth. And he said, I am he. And the text says that when Jesus says, I am he, that this powerful force came out from him and that it caused all of the Pharisees and the scribes, including Judas, to fall down on one knee. Now, what's interesting is if you look in your Bible, especially if you have a King James, the I am he in, J in John chapter 18, verse 6, is italicized, which means that that he was added in order that people would know what it's being referenced to. So in other words, if you look at the original, it means that it only says that Jesus said, I am. Sound familiar? <laughs> And we know that when Jesus speaks, what it shows here is the power and the authority that came out from Christ. Remember in the creation story, right? God speaks, and we know that Jesus was the person who brought about the creation. He speaks and things happen. Here we see it again. He spoke, and it calls them all to come down when he said that I am who I am. And when that happened... The theory is that there was a young man that was buried in the garden there, and that most powerful thing not only caused people to fall back, but caused that young man to raise from the dead. And here's where they start connecting it then. It's, it's really interesting, because they then say that that same young man is the same one that is then referenced later on in Mark chapter 16, verse 5 where it says that they go to the tomb on the day of the resurrection, and it doesn't say that they find an angel in the tomb. It says they find a young man, the same words. And they were afraid. Well, why were they afraid? Well, because it was the young man that they saw there that night that had been raised from the dead. And this young man gives testimony saying, he's not here, he is risen. Now, we don't know if it's the certain young man is in reference to uh, an angel, because some of the Gospels accounts say angel, but it's interesting how Mark's Gospel, it again connects this certain young man and, and that certain young man. Again, we can't necessarily know, but again, he's wearing a white garment, which is the same garment that was left behind. Again, a very interesting theory. Some believe, and this is the common belief, this is actually the one that I actually hold to, and I think there's the most validity to it, is that it is Mark himself. It is the author of the gospel himself. That Mark here is speaking in the third person. Now, I understand uh, Mark, uh, you know, doing this um, because I know I, if I was the one that left naked running through the garden, I wouldn't want to identify myself either. Keep that one secret and a mystery throughout time. But it wasn't uncommon for gospel writers to refer to themselves in the third person when they're giving an eyewitness account. They didn't want to put the attention on themselves. They always wanted the attention to stay on Christ. We see John practice this, as we talked about earlier. John practiced this in his gospel as well. He oftentimes referred to himself in the third person. And the reason why this holds some validity is not just because John follows example in doing it in his gospel, but also the details that are given in this account of who this man is and what took place leading up to it, lead us to believe it had to be an eyewitness that saw all of this. And that eyewitness had to have been the gospel writer. Also, if you go through the book of Acts, we see that this was a common pattern for Mark. Mark fled uh, the, from doing the work of Christ or standing with the gospel in Acts 13 and Acts 15. You see him you see him depart and leave when situations got tough with the Apostle Paul. So it seems to be a common pattern with Mark. So I give you those things just as, just as fun and just as things to, to, to look at to show you how you can, you know, gain stuff from Scripture. But here, here's the truth this morning. We don't know who this man is. 
who this certain young man is. We know that he's young, but we don't know the identity of it. And here's the thing, it's not important. It's not important. And most times when we see that this kind of thing happens where an anonymous person is mentioned in a very key role, I believe that it's left anonymous because you and I could insert ourselves into that very role that that person is listed in the Gospels. It could very easily be you or me that decided to run away when the persecution came. It could very easily have been you or me even in our day and age when persecution comes against us and, 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 and we try to flee Christ, that left Christ alone and we're willing to run away naked and cause embarrassment to ourselves, just so that way we wouldn't have to endure the same kind of things that Christ was about to endure. Let's be honest. And so I think we see these things left anonymous oftentimes because the gospel writer is inviting us through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit to put ourselves into that picture. And I know you and I can both identify with it. So th that's the first question. Who is the certain young man? The second question in the application for the text today is why is it here? <laughs> why in the world is this text located in Scripture? Now, we know that it's in the Bible for a reason, right? We, we know that Mark was led under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost to include it. I mean, if it is Mark, I would hope that we see evidence of the Holy Spirit urging him to include this, because if I'm Mark, I'm not including it at all. Even if I refer to myself in the third person. I want to spare myself the embarrassment and, and the shame that went along with, with what happened. So we know that it's under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit that something like this would be included. So what does it mean? Can I tell you this morning, church, everything is in your Bible for a reason. And so the presence of this man in the garden, in this text, included in your Bible, is not meaningless. And the account that we have of this taking place is not insignificant. Every jot and tittle in the Bible is inspired and can be applied. There's something here that you and I need to grasp. And like I said earlier, I believe that the things that are here, that the Holy Spirit showed me in the midst of this, are things that are now more able to be grasped because of the situation that we find ourselves in over the last couple of weeks, now more than ever before. Look with me again at the text. The first thing I believe we need to grasp is the fear that is in the garden. The fear that is in the garden. Now we need to understand the atmosphere of when these two verses take place. Remember, there is an incredible amount of fear that is going on between the disciples, between those who are there other than the disciples, between the soldiers and the Pharisees and the scribes and Judas, right? I mean, this is where everything comes to a, a head point with Jesus' ministry. This is where he's getting ready to be taken into captivity and the, and the beginning works of crucifixion are going to take place. This is where betrayal happens. There is a lot of fear going on here. Tensions are high. There's anger that is present. Uh, present. There's crisis. And it leads to some crazy stuff happening because of the product of the environment. I mean, we saw earlier in the text, it says that Peter reaches and cuts off, right? I'm not going to let you take my Lord. I'm, we're going to fight. Jesus is going to establish his kingdom. And so Peter draws a sword and cuts off the ear of the high priest servant, a man by the name of Malchus. So we see that there's this tipping point, and that could have very well caused the entire situation to explode in the midst of this fear. That first move by Peter. It could have easily meant that the soldiers on the other side would rush the disciples, and there could have been a mass slaying right there. All of the disciples could have been killed because of Peter acting in fear of the moment. Heightened emotions. Tensions. But you know what's really interesting is that in the midst of that fear and in the midst of that unknown and in the midst of that tension and in the midst of that anger, you know what you see Jesus do? Jesus stands in the gap. 
Jesus stands in between the disciples and the soldiers who came that night. Jesus stands in between the disciples and the scribes and the Pharisees, and he picks up that ear, and he puts it back on the servant. In other words, Jesus de-escalates the situation real quick. He guards and he shields the disciples from the wrath that could have come from those who came to get him that night. He righted the wrong that Peter had caused, that demanded, could have demanded retribution. Listen to me, I don't know about you, but in the midst of everything that's going on right now, this is symbolic. You know, it's symbolic of Calvary, of what was about to happen later on, where Jesus stood in the gap <laughs> and shielded you from the wrath of God. And Jesus took the wrath of God on the cross. He did it for his disciples, and he did it for you and me. But you know what else today, church? Listen to me. If you are saved in the midst of all the fear, in the midst of all the anxiety, in the midst of all the uncertainty, in the midst of heightened tensions and emotions, can I tell you this morning, Jesus Christ stands in the gap to bring peace in the midst of it. He's there in the midst of fear. He's there in the midst of the cultural circumstance. He's there in the midst of uncertainty, and he's shielding you. He's standing in the gap for you. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the place of my enemies. You anointed my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. We see the good shepherd standing in the gap in the midst of fear this morning. I think that's the first thing that you and I can grasp from this situation. The second thing that we can grasp is the forsaking of the disciples. The forsaking of the disciples. You know what's interesting? When Jesus stands in the gap after Peter draws a sword and cuts off the ear, if you take the entire gospel account of what's going on here, you go over to John chapter 18, you see that Jesus had a specific word for Peter when it happened. After Jesus had healed Malchus, he turned to Peter in John 18 verse 11 and he said, Then said Jesus unto Peter, Put up thy sword into the sheath. The cup which my father hath given me, shall I not drink it? In other words, Jesus looked at not just Peter, but he looked at his disciples who were ready to fight. You know, we give this idea that the disciples were fearful when they ran away sometimes. The disciples were ready to fight. Peter was ready to fight. But Jesus stood there and told them, essentially, to stand down. Fighting wasn't going to happen. In other words, he said, are you going to take away from me the cup that my father has to drink? Are you going to take away what is about to happen? In other words, you don't know what is about to happen. And here's the funny thing. They should have known. He told them about this throughout the Gospels, that the Son of Man must be betrayed and suffer to bring about the salvation of mankind. They were told of all of this, but oftentimes they tuned it out because what? They were too interested and focused on themselves. Who was going to rule and reign with Jesus? What were we going to do when Jesus uh, took care of things? Yeah, they heard that he was going to suffer, but all in the end they thought, you know what? It's probably all symbolic. Jesus is still going to defeat the Roman government, and we're going to rule and reign, and he's going to bring in his kingdom right now. They were thinking physically. They were thinking earthly. So listen to me. When Jesus turned and looked at Peter and the disciples and told them to stand down, will you take this cup for me? Listen to me. I don't think the disciples forsook Christ because they were fearful. I think the disciples turned and forsook Christ because 
their idea of what was going to happen has now been shattered. Their own selfish, personal understanding of what they thought should take place is now gone. In other words, their expectation, their understanding, and listen to me, their identity was gone now. They were going to rise up. They were going to be the people who helped Jesus take down the government. And Jesus is telling them, nope, that's not how this is going to go. That's not how this is going to go. And because Jesus said that, the disciples knew what would come next. If we don't get out of here, they're going to take us. So yeah, there's a part of them that ran away in fear, but can I tell you, there's a part of them that ran away because they were miffed. They were confused. Everything that they thought would happen was not going to happen. Their worlds were now turned completely upside down. You know, it gives more understanding as to why Jesus, or why then Peter betrayed Jesus three times. I don't think it was necessarily that he was fearful for his life. I think he was upset with Christ. Christ showed him up in front of everybody. And rightfully so. But check this out. You see, these disciples were afraid that night. Not necessarily for their lives, but they were afraid because everything had changed. Their plans had changed. Their expectations were shattered. Their dreams were cut off. And now they had to try to live and adjust in this new reality without Christ, who was being taken. I don't know about you, but these disciples were afraid, and I can relate to that today. You see, for a lot of us today, when things don't go as planned in our walk with Christ— when we have certain expectations of what we think Christ should be doing for us and how he should be answering our prayers and how our lives should go, <laughs> and they don't happen that way, we're like the disciples. We kind of give Jesus that look of, how could you do this to me? This isn't how it's supposed to go. Jesus, I know better. And then the reality hits us that God's in control and we're not. And we have to be left making sense and trying to pick up the pieces of what's going on and make sense of all that. And instead of responding in faith and saying, Lord, I'm going to trust you and I'm going to stand by you, what we often do is we run away in fear. We don't know how to act. We walk away disappointed. You know, oftentimes that happens because Jesus says something that doesn't fit our views of Christianity, right? Right? We oftentimes, in America especially, we've taken this Bible and we have made Christianity what we think it should be in America. <laughs> and we come across something in this word that Jesus has spoken or that Christ has revealed through someone, and we realize that it does not mesh with our version of American Christianity. You know what it does? It causes us to wrestle and struggle. It causes us to get uncomfortable. It causes us to get afraid of what we have always thought and believed might not actually be the way Jesus wants it. And at that point, we have a decision to make. We either run away or we get closer. We either turn in fear and go away from the Lord or we get closer. You know, we see that the disciples were afraid, but then we get to the man in the garden. We find out that this man didn't leave with the disciples. This man stuck around, stood around. And so while the first wave of the disciples forsook him, this man here in verse 51 still followed. Even as Jesus was being led away, it says in verse 51, what's it say? It says, and there followed him a certain young man. So this man wasn't phased by what Jesus was saying. This man said, you know what, I may not understand, but I'm going to keep going. But we know that eventually he turned and left. So why did he 
eventually turn and leave? Well, we see. It says, and having a linen cloth cast about his naked body, and the young man laid hold on him. In other words, one of the soldiers finally said, okay, you didn't run away. You're in my grasp. I'm going to grab you. (laughs) And at that moment that the person was grabbed, he then struggled and ran away. Struggled so much that he lost his cloth and ran away naked. Fear got the best of him, too. And the reason why I think that this man it took longer is because while he may have had faith in Christ, he only had the hypothetical in his mind, yes, they could come against us, but now it became a reality to this young man in the garden. They were coming against me. They are going to try to kill me. They just don't want Christ. They want my life as well. You see, when the rubber hits the road... (laughs) things change for us as well. You know, for some of us, this coronavirus thing had been going on for a long time, but you know what? It was over there. It was in China. It was in other parts of the world. And so while we knew that it was a possibility it could come, it wasn't really affecting our lives. And so we stayed firm. We didn't necessarily understand what was going. Some of us got crazy and went and bought all kinds of toilet paper, I know. But The moment that it came to the United States, the moment that it came to the eastern seaboard, the moment that it came to Pennsylvania, the moment that it came to York County, now it becomes real. And now we're with the rest of them. And listen to me, I'm not saying you shouldn't take precautions, but there's a real fear that has set in. It became more real to you. And so there's more drastic action. Look, this young man, not only when he had it come right to his doorstep and he decided to flee, I want you to consider how he fled this morning. Not only was it the feeling, but now it was actual. It says that the young men laid hold on him and he left the linen cloth and fled them naked. In other words... I'd rather be naked in the woods than be arrested with Jesus. (laughs) Or I'd rather have a soiled reputation (laughs) than to be killed with Jesus. You know, this man may have left Jesus and abandoned him, but he found himself at some point naked in the woods, stripped down from everything that was covering him, alone with God. And at some point, he had to come to the realization of what he had done. The extremes in which he went to to get away from the Son of God and faced with persecution. Everything stripped away. Can I tell you in another way? I see this in our society right now. There's a nakedness that's going on with each and every one of us. There's a nakedness, Christian, where things in our society and things that are our norms by our lives being turned upside down have all been stripped away. In some cases, our jobs have been stripped away. In some cases, our income has been stripped away. Our leisure has been stripped away. Our travel has been stripped away. You name it, and it's been stripped away. And you know what? It's even something that we can't even control that's stripping these things away and telling us we need to stay home, we cannot go out, we cannot do this, we cannot do that. You know what that's done, church? It's stripped away everything that used to be in between us and our relationship with God. And now we stand there naked before the Lord, and there ain't nothing between us and our relationship. Can I ask you something this morning? Do you like what you see? Because I don't know about you, it makes me a little afraid. It makes me a little unsettled. Because for many of us, all the things that have been stripped away, that's where we put our identity. Christian, you know what a great thing that I think God's going to do in the midst of all of this? By taking all of this stuff away, it's going to force us as Christians to put our identity in nothing else but Jesus Christ. 
And we need to remember that our identity is in Christ alone and that everything else is a detail. I mean, my goodness, even for you, Christian, who has your identity wrapped up in what you do in the church or where you go to church or what church you're a part of and you boast and you take pride in those, they're all gone too. You can't even come. It's just you and Jesus now. Just like that man. He may have fled Jesus because he was afraid, but he had to stand in the garden naked with God and give an account. That's either going to cause you to draw closer and change your perspective and change your priorities, or it's going to cause you to flee. I don't know about you, but some of the things have been stripped away. It's been embarrassing to me. The Lord's really revealed so much of my free time that I thought or so much that I thought I was busy that I should not have been partaking in that I could have been doing what the Lord wanted me to do the time that I truly had of reading my Bible you know I saw a meme the other day it said you know I always thought that I didn't have enough time to deep clean my house now that I have all the time in the world I have found out that that's not really the reason (laughs) it's the same with the things of our faith We always said we didn't have enough time to read our Bibles. We always said we didn't have enough time to pray. We always said we didn't have enough time to do X, Y, and Z. Truth of the matter is, is you have the time now. They've been stripped away from you, and you're embarrassed because you still don't do them. I don't mean to be a heavy this morning. I'm just trying to bring some light to this text. We're all kind of naked and afraid right now with what's going on. The question is, how will we react Will we draw closer to him? Will we run away and hide like Adam did in the garden when it was revealed to him that they were naked when the sinfulness came and they ate of the garden? Will we try to hide and cover up or will we be honest and truthful with God and get things right and make changes and let him do some work in our heart and in our life? What's the white sheets that need that God's stripping away from you or maybe still need to be stripped away from you to get your attention. That's how God deals with us sometimes, church. It's not the soft and gentle. Sometimes it's the yanking away. It's the wake-up call. Last but not least, I want you to see not just the fear in the garden, the forsaking of his disciples, but here's the good news in the midst of it, church, the fortitude of Jesus. The fortitude of Jesus. Look with me at verse 48 of Matthew, or Mark 14. It says, And Jesus answered and said unto them, Are ye come out as against a thief, with swords and with staves to take me? Jesus is talking to the people who came to capture him. It says, I was daily with you in the temple teaching, and ye took me not. And ye took me not. You know, it's interesting. In the midst of the fear that surrounds what's going on, in the midst of the disciples forsaking, in the midst of Jesus knowing what's next, I love that you see his fortitude. Jesus is calm, cool, and collective. He's not rattled. Jesus has a peace and a poise to him. And you see that because, look, in the midst of this, he's taking jabs at the leaders who are there to get him. He's jabbing at them. He says, come on, you're coming against me as a thief? What did I do? You had the opportunity many other times before to arrest me in the garden or to arrest me other places, and you didn't do it then. What's so special now? He's calling them out. Moments earlier, he was sweating blood talking to his father in prayer. And the Lord gave him the strength to take this cup, and now we see it being played out. He's calm, he's cool, he's collective, he's got composure. Why? Look at the last part of verse 49. It's just what Jesus said. He said to them, but the scriptures must be fulfilled. But the scriptures must be fulfilled. Listen to me. There's fear. There's an arrest coming. The disciples have all left and fled. One of them would rather be naked. Listen to me. It would look as if God was fumbling the ball here. (laughs) It would look as if 
what was taking place was a massive failure on Jesus' part. But listen to me, church. God was in complete control. Jesus was in complete control. It was going just as planned. Or as Jesus said, according to the scriptures. I read one commentary this week. It said that 25 specific prophecies to the Messiah were fulfilled in a 24-hour period in this text. That's crazy. And Jesus knew it. He knew who he was and what he had come to do. And listen to me, he knew it because of the scriptures. That's where Jesus grabbed his fortitude or gained his fortitude from. He could have peace in the midst because he knew the word of God. Listen to me this morning, church. I know that we are in times of fear and anxiety and questioning. And I know that we are in times uh, like never before of heightened emotions and uncertainty. Listen to me. The closer you are to Christ in staying beside him in the midst of all of this, and the more you abide in his word, the more fortitude you will have in any situation the more peace that passes all understanding you will have in any situation. I've encountered that with some Christians during this time. You know, you see all of this stuff going on, and some are trying to say that it's the tribulation. It's not the tribulation. We're still here. <laughs> Christian, you're still here, praise the Lord. <laughs> you know what this is? If you know your Bible, <laughs> you know that this is a shadow of what is to come in the tribulation. Therefore, you can have peace that you weren't left behind. <laughs> Therefore, you can have peace that while this may be one of those things that's a shadow of it, there's still worse that's going to come, and if you're saved, you ain't going to be a part of it. You see, the Word of God can bring a sound mind and can bring a sense of peace and can give you fortitude and strength in the midst of anything that this broken world throws at you. It's according to the Word. Be in the book that you may have peace in the midst of it. You know, I, I see that some, some radio stations I, I read are, are, are playing Christmas songs because all of this has brought a sense of discouragement and depression to a lot of people. I know that this situation has affected very many, in, in fact, uh, kids in school, whether it be graduations or sports or stuff like that, um, and not being able to go and do the things that we freely ta has, have taken for granted over all this time. And it's caused depression, and it's so much so that some radios are going to play Christmas music to get people's spirits up. Listen to me, church. I, I appreciate that. It points to Jesus Christ and his birth and, and, and God sending his son into this world as our only hope. But listen to me. The joy of the Lord is our strength. And where it says that in Scripture, it refers to the, it, it refers to the word of God. The word of God is your joy because you know... <laughs> what's going to happen. And you know that the love that Christ has for you, and you know the assurance that you have in him. Don't necessarily turn on Christmas music. Get in the word. I know this is a common theme, and I may be beating it with a dead horse over these next couple of weeks, but it's true. Get in the word. You'll be amazed at the peace that Christ will bring. Look, there's many fearful things as we come to a close this morning. There's many fearful things that are going to happen in this life and in this world. This is one of them. We're going through a time and a season right now of COVID-19. Guess what? There's been others before, and we've gone through it. There are going to be others to come, and we'll get through it. But listen to me. If, if you're online and you're listening here this morning and, and you don't have Jesus Christ in your life, What are you clinging to for hope in the midst of this? What are you clinging to for peace in the midst of this? Because if you don't have Christ, none of this makes sense. Fear and anxiety are going to rip your life apart. Listen, Jesus knew 
Here's the good news this morning. Jesus knew the lengths that the disciples would go in abandoning him. He knew what he had to face after they abandoned him. He knew that they would continue to let him down even later. Listen to me. Jesus still went forward with his plan. Jesus still went to the cross and suffered and died and poured out his blood for your sins and for mine. There was nothing you and I could do to stop it. That's how great his love for us is. In fact, the disciples all fleeing him that night was actually sort of symbolic because they could have nothing to do with Christ bringing salvation to this world. It was Jesus alone. And as lonely as it was for Christ, listen to me, he took that pill, he stood in that gap, so that way you would never have to. And while we may face many fearful things in this life and this world, you know what the most fearful situation that you could ever face is? To die and not know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. To stand one day naked in front of Christ. No good works. No acclimates. No prestige. You can't take anything from this life with you. And when you stand before God, are you going to be, when you're naked before him, look, the only thing that can save you is the blood of Jesus Christ. That one day you cried out to Jesus Christ that you were a sinner and you needed to be be saved. And as the old song go, you took the tattered robe off and you put on the sparkly white robe. It was the righteousness of Christ. That's the only thing that will calm your fear. That's the only thing that will get you through that situation. Because without Christ and his precious blood shed for our sins, there is no hope. Look, we're rubbing ourselves all over in hand sanitizer right now. It may get rid of the the germs on your hands and other things, but listen to me. The only thing that can get your sins wiped away permanently forever is the precious blood of Jesus Christ. And you got to be bathed in it. You got to be washed in it. There's power There's power, there's wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Praise the Lord if you're watching this morning and you've never made that step. You have the opportunity right now. Scripture says that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that he raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Believe in your heart, confess with your mouth, and have the peace of Christ Have Jesus Christ come and enter into your life. If that's you today, I hope that you take that step. That no matter what may happen, you know, and you can have peace in this life, that you know what the scriptures say and how it's all going to turn out. And Christian, I want to talk to you real quick as we close. These things can make us wonder about our identity. And many of us, even though we're saved, we have our identity wrapped up in so many other things. That's why you see some Christians wondering what it is that we're supposed to do and what we're supposed to act when all of this is taken away because your identity wasn't just in Christ. Some of us, our identity is wrapped up in our jobs. Our jobs, our identity is wrapped up in our titles. Our identity is wrapped up in our service. No, you're supposed to have your identity in Christ and Christ alone. That way when all else goes away and all else fails and all else falls, which it will, you still have Christ. And when you still have Christ, that's all you need. The fear of this situation, the fear that was in the garden can strip away a lot of stuff. Christian, I want to encourage you today, lean into Christ. Lean into Christ. Put your identity in him and him alone. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you again so much for this day.
and for your word. We thank you, Lord, for these passages that oftentimes, Lord, go unnoticed. But, Lord, we thank you that it's there for a reason, and we thank you that we can glean your heart from them. Lord, I ask now that as we uh, stir upon this text, as we let it move within our hearts and, and we digest it, Lord, that you would do a mighty work within us today. That you would remind us that you are always with us. And that, Lord, we would stand with you in the midst of whatever takes place. May we put our faith in you afresh and anew this morning as we go before your throne and sing a final song today. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to have one more song this morning. I don't know how appropriate it is for this time, but it's a good old hymn of the church. Will you sing along? Shackled by a heavy burden Neath the load of guilt and shame Then the hand of Jesus touched me encouraged this morning, Christian, you do not have to be naked and afraid, but you can be clothed in the righteousness of Christ, and you can have the peace, the perfect peace that passes all understanding. Grab the hand next to you this morning if you're at home. If you're at home, you can do it. Social distancing doesn't apply there. And let us end our time together the way that we always do, by reciting the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, 
hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Be blessed, Grace Church. Oh, he touched me. Oh, he touched me. And all oh, the joy that floods my soul. Someday.